I recently found myself on another bizarre staunch TV journey, all stemming from my recent Hear Me Out segment on Dead Man on Campus and my recent Vanilla Ice adventures. Which got me thinking, you know, what is the most 90s movie of all time? And you know, I really wanted to know what that was. And I also felt that that would make an underwhelming project, so I got right on it. But what does the most 90s movie of all time mean? Well, I guess it can mean a few different things, but to me it's all about the aesthetic, marketing, music, basically a time capsule on film, you know? And there are endless titles to choose from, goddamn. So I figured this would turn to a series eventually, as nearly all the films I came up with were favorites of mine growing up. So I circled back to the MTV films of the 90s and found myself face to face with pure evil. Give me a kiss, babe. And I found that, hey, this is definitely one of the most 90s movies of all time. <laughs> Dear Mom, I made it to New York safe and sound. Hands up, Pinhead! <coughs> the film tells the tale of Joe, played here by an essentially pre-famed Jerry O'Connell. Now Joe, who moves to New York, has a rough time, so to speak, fitting in and whatnot. Things start to look up for him, though, when he lands a shitty job and finds himself living in squalor with thousands of sentient wise-cracking roaches who decide to help Joe become the best Joe he can be. But these are not ordinary roaches. They're singing, dancing, wise-cracking roaches. The garbage in the moonlight gives off a lovely smell. Lovely smell. Sewage with my baby in a little roach motel. Please don't care. Joe's apartment had some really humble beginnings. That began, apparently, when the stars aligned or favors were being paid because this movie would never be produced today. On this scale, um, not really, at least. And even if it was, I mean, it just wouldn't work. Joe's apartment really makes some ballsy creative decisions here. And for it being MTV's first produced film, they did not choose an aesthetically pleasing film for the Gen Xers it was aimed at. Which, I guess, makes sense because... You know, everything sucked back then, but like, it was cool too, dude. Or whatever. But you know, um, for the younger generation such as myself, Joe's apartment proved to be quite the romp. I was drawn to the computer effects, and the song and dance, and parody from the Roaches, as a youngster of course, and um, I was not at all involved in its subplots to be honest. Which ironically, upon rewatching recently, I found many of the songs to be goddamn annoying and was drawn more to the silly subplots involving urinal cakes and befriending horrible performance artists. I'm sorry. There won't be any rock and roll tonight. This is all that's left. In fact, there's an over-exaggerated post-apocalyptic vibe throughout the picture I completely missed in my youth. Kind of a mix of the dark backward universe and, you know, the all-encompassing wacky world of Freet. At least, I like to think these flicks exist in the same distasteful universe, to say the least. I'm not gonna lie, these bug features, you know, whether meant for laughs or not, always creeped me out. Ever since I was a kid and I saw The Nest, I just get this uneasy feeling watching movies like this that something's crawling on you, you know? Even with Joe's apartment, I'm like, Ugh, get out of there, dude. There's there's roaches everywhere, and you kind of start feeling them crawling you, and you're just like, get, what the fuck? Ugh. Anyways, uh, I always kind of found it odd that the studio went to Jerry O'Connell specifically for the role. As to be honest, he wasn't anybody at the time. I mean, by then he had of course shined bright in Stand By Me, one of my all-time favorites, and he was a legit child actor, yeah. But as far as the teen audience he was being aimed at here, his only role was the dud calendar girl. You know, the Jason Priestley vehicle about meeting Marilyn Monroe. Good little flick, uh, maybe I'll talk about that one soon, let me know if you want to see that. Anyway, so Jerry O'Connell, I thought was a weird choice for the lead role, but he's just fantastic in it. 
He has a real schlubby vulnerability, and you really just feel bad for the guy at times. Naturally, there's a love interest in the film as Joe, played by Jerry O'Connell, falls in love with a beautiful civil servant and an amateur gardener, played by Megan Ward. Drink up. Down to that, sweetie. Here's to life's little surprises. We have fine as Megan Ward, and yet another 90s classic, as Freaked, Glory Days, and of course, PCU also made the list of the most 90s movies of all time. But we'll get back to those later in the series. That classic 90s Piven hairline. And surprisingly, there are some A-listers here, like Robert Vaughn, David Huddleston, Vincent Pastore. Wait, is he an A-lister? Oh, and um, they also rounded up one hell of a voice acting cast here for the Roaches. We get the film debut of Billy West, Voices from Dave Chappelle, Godfrey, B.D. Wong, Tim Blake Nelson, and uh, this was actually, sadly, the last voice acting performance from Willie Lopez himself, Rick Aviles. Are you ready for something itty bitty, baby? Oh, come and get it. And I didn't like the roaches, and I didn't like the sewers, and I didn't no. like the garbage, and I didn't like the urinal cakes, right. which supply a very large part of the plot. Right. And I didn't like the fact that this entire movie was just filled with such disgusting yeah. and nauseating images that my stomach got queasy, and I didn't want to watch it yeah. anymore. Joe's apartment had fairly humble beginnings, as it was the brainchild of filmmaker John Payson, who previously worked on the legendary Liquid Television. So John Payson was definitely cut from the right cloth, and he got the idea for Joe's apartment from a few experimental films, one being Twilight of the Cockroaches, which featured a hybrid live-action and animated roach aesthetic. So, you know, basically, when Payson began making his own short films, he lobbied to MTV to air his works in between commercials and such, you know, all during the grunge heydays of the network. And it proved to be really popular to the Gen X Beavis and Butthead audience, you know, I remember seeing this when it first aired. It was a big hype, and uh, for the big hype behind it actually was that supposedly there was an actual bowl of no shit roaches that were going to be dumped on this young act actress's head. Uh, you know, something I just had to see. <laughs> Shut up! I mean, drink up. Now, <laughs> So when the short film won a few awards and got some traction, MTV decided to greenlight a film version as its first feature. What the hell? They even offered Payson the directing duties. And while yes, it is the first film from MTV, at the exact same time, a Beavis and Butthead movie was also greenlit as well. But more on that later. Ironically, upon viewing now, it's not the singing roaches or even Megan Ward's fine ass that kept my attention. Rather, it's these jokes that either went over my head or the, or just aging like fine wine. <laughs> now, this came out during that special effects renaissance that happened in the mid to late 90s. And luckily, you know, this film managed to get out before that got too out of hand. But for the most part, all of the effects still stand up pretty well today. <laughs> The effects were done by Blue Sky Studios, who before working on their first feature, Joe's Apartment, were mainly a title and logo production house. But here, man, they really brought it, and produced some fascinating full motion animated cockroaches. Apparently done with the, the same effects engine from Jurassic Park, whatever that means. But their work proved lasting, and seriously, it still works today. Mainly because of the overall tone of the film, it, it really does help it all, all just hold up fantastically and with some flawless seeming with practical effects and whatnot the overall effects of the film were a rousing success so much that 20th century fox execs made the move to acquire the company who then went on to do some pretty cool shit 
I remember this flick getting a pretty big push, you know, in comic books and magazines and stuff. I even had the poster on my wall for years. And there was even a big push for the hip soundtrack featuring tunes from Madball, Soul Coffee, De La Soul, Green Day, who had a fun little montage here, and uh, the soundtrack even had Moby, who also had a small cameo in the film. And all the Roach songs were performed by the Roach Chorus. Nice. Yet with all of this, Joe's apartment was a bona fide bomb, making just over $1 million on a $13 million budget. God damn, needless to say, it was critically panned across the board and was a pretty big embarrassment for MTV at the time. I don't think it's funny. Fuck these guys, what do they know? It did great on video and audiences loved it. Hi guys. What you making? A crack house? <gasps> oh my god. They just didn't, you know, go to the theaters. Lesson learned, I guess. I mean, no sweat for MTV, as their next feature was a complete success, even being a cultural phenomenon of sorts, and their choices for films were much more marketable down the line. Well, for a while at least. John Payson would go on to direct TV with shows like The PJs and Arliss, and wouldn't direct another feature film. Megan Ward would also take the TV route after Joe's Apartment, with shows like Dark Skies, Melrose Place, and Fantasy Island. You know, she still does some film work here and there, but mainly TV films. And she still works in television today and can be seen pretty regularly. Luckily, though, for Jerry O'Connell, he was also filming another little-known romp at the time called Jerry Maguire. And even though he had a small part in that, well, he was still in the biggest movie of the year, being Jerry Maguire, and people forgot all about this silly little roach movie he did. And his career will remain intact till today. His Instagram's a lot of fun. I recommend following. Oh, and oddly, Jim Turner, who played Walter's shit, <laughs> went on to be in some Payson directed Arliss episodes and joined O'Connell again on Sliders. And oddly enough, he was also Randy of the Redwoods, an MTV regular from back in the day. You remember this guy? I watch MTV every morning when I get up for a couple hours. And then right around breakfast time, you know, I watch it for a little bit more. And then about lunch when I feed the fish, you know, I feed the fish and watch them watch MTV. And then about supper time, me and the dog feedback, we watch MTV. You know, you can never have too much structure in your life. I indeed remember this one fondly. Although, another thing that I found upon rewatching was... Some of the songs do get really annoying, I think I said that earlier, and you know, there's a lot of them, oh my god. The pitch shifted vocals and you know, things like that can just be an, a real ear sore at times. I, I don't know, I guess technically it's my favorite musical, but, uh, huh. They just don't make them like they used to, my dudes. I for one would love to see a sequel or, or at least like a scene with Joe and the fellas nowadays. I'm sure O'Connell's down for it, he seems like one hell of a dude, I mean why not? I plan on touching on the other MTV produced films of the 90s, let me know which one is your favorite down in the comments. Please subscribe, like, share and hit that bell. And please consider joining our Patreon and buying some staunch TV streetwear. Be somebody baby!